Recently, I've seen a pretty significant change in the approach to OP, and this has become apparent on some languages like Rust. I wanna go into a deep dive of how OP is evolving, which will make you understand OP more fully, and able to utilize the good from OP and discard the questionable. I'll discuss the main conflict in OP and several other things that get changed in modern interpretations of it. This is specifically the structure of this video. First, its original vision. Second, what the conflict is, and also what a modern interpretation of OP looks like. Finally, what you should take away from this video. Also, how you can apply it. Before OP, the popular high-level languages were languages like Lisp. OP itself was invented in the 60s. Alan Kay got the idea of objects from biology and described it like cells making up a living organism. These cells communicate with each other through messages and have implementation details which you don't need to worry about, which is encapsulation. To him, messages were the main feature of OOP, not classes. Developers soon discovered that it was really convenient to represent elements in a user interface as objects. This is why OOP got popular in the first place. This was also around the time that GUIs got popular, and a lot of frameworks were object-oriented. OOP as a paradigm got even more popular when Java was released. And as it got more popular, it got more and more modified. To Alan Kay, inheritance was not even considered when designing OOP. Not only was inheritance not considered OOP, neither were classes or polymorphism. This shows that the vision of OOP is very skewed. A language much closer to the original vision of OOP is Smalltalk or JavaScript. Something like Java is not even close to being object-oriented if you go by the original vision and definition. This means that OOP is not OOP anymore, which makes you wonder what even is it supposed to be. Some people think that it needs to be changed, others that it isn't necessary at all. I want to explain the modern ways of interpreting OOP. The major distinction that divides modern OOP is composition versus inheritance. And both of these are a way to describe a relationship between two objects. Most developers agree that objects are pretty good, but they disagree on how to implement relationships between those objects. Composition is a relationship between objects where object A has object B inside it. The other type, inheritance, is a relationship where object B is object A, or explained with an example, a car is a vehicle. Composition is actually a lot closer to the values of original OOP. Even in the famous Gang of Four OOP book, the authors recommend composition in most cases. If you have a computer science background, you were probably taught that you should use composition or inheritance based on how they would be in real life, but not everyone agrees with this approach, which I'll go into later. Composition tends to be more flexible and less rigid, and this is mostly because you choose what to inherit. You can also make yourself less dependent on the parent than inheritance. Inherent in quotation, you don't really inherit, you just overwrite. And the other one, inheritance, isn't really that flexible compared to composition. This is because you inherit everything, you don't choose what you want to inherit. You could technically overwrite the methods you don't want to inherit to do nothing, but this isn't really a great way to solve it, since developers expect those methods to do something. And recently, people have been preferring a composition over inheritance in general. Mostly because of the added flexibility. What's even more interesting is that some languages have actually been leaving inheritance out entirely, and I'll give an example on this later. I'll demonstrate why this distinction matters on an example in C++. This is just regular inheritance. The only thing to note here is the virtual keyboard, which is necessary for something called dynamic dispatch, which is just the C++ way of overriding methods. Here we run into a problem. If someone changes the return type of do something, we get an error in B. You would have never run into this problem if you use composition, and this is the example with composition. As you can see, you can change the return types without an error, and that's not necessarily the point though. The overall point is that composition is less coupled together, whereas inheritance is strict in terms of coupling, and there are a lot of advantages to composition, but the last one that I will mention is access control. With traditional inheritance, we inherit everything, but with composition, we choose what we want to inherit. This is extremely useful when you're inheriting from large classes, where we only want to select a few methods. A good example of a language with a modern take on OOP is Rust. Rust is the OOP without inheritance. The founders of Rust created this to capitalize on all of the good of OOP without the bad, which inheritance is widely considered as, and here's how the Rust book describes how Rust handles OOP. Also here are some reasons why someone might consider leaving inheritance out of a language. 
The gist of this is that it shares more code than is often necessary and it makes the program less flexible. Even Carbon, which plans to be a successor to C++, isn't abandoning inheritance, but it is restricting the use case of it. I would argue that this is the most important distinction in modern OOP implementation, and I expect that a lot of neural languages will ditch inheritance, or at least restrict it. To be slightly different, I'll use Go for this example. I want to talk about another feature of OOP that is now often missing. Also know that Rust is doing basically the same thing. What I want to talk about right now is the removal of constructors. The issue constructors have is that you can have five different constructors and they all have the same name with no indication of what combination of arguments make what. You could have a constructor with three strings and another with two, but you would have no idea what the difference between these two are. This is actually why Go prefers to use functions that act as constructors. Because of this, you can have different constructors with different names. Carbon is also moving away from constructors in the same way. And I can give you an example of this. Take Java's scanner class for example. There are a lot of constructors, all of which do something different. It would be slightly more verbose, but easier to read if, instead of them having the same name, they would have different names. With the original, you have no idea what the second parameter would be if you just saw someone call it. And if the variable was from a class 20 levels deep into inheritance and probably named, you wouldn't even know what the first argument was. In the modern way of doing constructors, the file constructor could just be called scanner from file and the second variation scanner from file with char set. With this modification, it's obvious even if you don't know what the variables are, even if you don't know what the types are. The interesting thing is that these changes aren't anything new. All of these changes are a return to the older way of doing OOP, the definition that I showed in the beginning. Also, these languages removed a lot more from OOP. These are just examples. I think current OOP isn't horrible. I think the modularity and abstraction it offers is extremely useful. But I think a lot of the changes to OOP in languages like Rust, Go and Carbon are a step in the right direction, and I predict that a lot of languages will follow this change. In general, the modern programming paradigm will probably become a blend of these paradigms. For you, this could mean different things based on who you are. As a solo developer, you could probably benefit from learning this new way of doing OOP, but it doesn't matter as much. If you switch jobs a lot, however, you will probably notice a difference in how companies implement OOP. And that's everything I wanted to cover. Subscribe if you want to see more.